Okay, I would like to call to order today's meeting for December 2nd, 2021 of the Nevada Governor's Office of Economic Development to order. Could I ask the clerk to take the roll, please? Absolutely, this is Jeanette Holgan for the record, and I'll now call the roll. Governor Sisolak? Here. Secretary Sagaski? I'm here. Thank you. Dr. Weldon Havens? Here. Thank you. Mr. Jay Barrett? Here. Thank you. Dr. Dana Bennett? Here. Okay. Mr. Ray Specht? Here. Okay. And for our non-voting members, we have Ms. Elisa Caferrata? I'm here. Thank you. Mr. Terry Reynolds? Here. All right, wonderful. Governor, we have quorum. Thank you. Uh, that closes item number one. We'll move on to item number two, public comment. This is the first time set aside for public comment. Anyone wishing to address the board on any item on today's agenda, please step forward, identify yourself for the record, and comments will be limited to three minutes. Do we have anybody in Las Vegas for public comment? I don't have anyone um, down here on the phone or online indicating they wish to give public comment at this time, Governor, and nothing written was submitted either. So we have no public comment. Okay. Correct. I'll close uh, item number two, public comment, move on to item number three, approval of the September 23rd board meeting minutes. Move Web for approval the with the amendments that were submitted. Was that Secretary Sagaski? Yes, sorry about that. It's Barbara that's, Sagaski. That's okay. I just want to make sure that uh, yes. they have a good record. We have a motion on the floor for approval. Is there any discussion? You're seeing none. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. Item number four, executive director update, director's report. Director Brown. Yes, thank you, Governor. We sent the formal report, but a couple of highlights for board members. Uh, we are hosting today uh, the European Union. Uh, we have 27 uh, representatives of the 27 nations of the European Union at uh, Blackfire here in Las Vegas for a three-day visit to Nevada. Uh, to see everything from switch to the stadium to meet with our local officials. Um, it's been organized directly with the uh, Embassy of Slovenia, which is the chair of the European Union now. Um, and we have uh, folks that have flown in from abroad, folks that are based in Washington, D.C., or diplomats that are based in Washington, D.C. And uh, this is one of the first times they've ventured out into a state like this is the European Union. And so it's quite the honor to be hosting them today. The governor met with their leaders uh, two days ago. Uh, and they're going to really understand the opportunities in Nevada. Uh, we also, in the international space, uh, from President Biden, uh, were one of about 30 or 40 uh, entities that were recognized with a presidential award in excellence in exporting. So as the world is coming back alive, our international opportunities are coming back with it. Um, you know, we have a wonderful Great Gatsby moment on the Strip. Um, record record activity there, supplemented with incredible interest in our in the sports uh, sector here, and and all of that's working, which is allowing us to soldier on in uh, in, in the background, working on uh, how we rebalance and diversify, particularly the Southern Nevada economy and manufacturing, logistics, healthcare, and technology. We are really involved right now with several federal departments. Uh, we were awarded a million dollar planning grant from the Department of Commerce to help jumpstart our uh, economic planning and also to provide resources for others such as tribal communities and uh, communities of poverty to make application for federal assistance under various ARPA programs that the EDA has. Uh, we have worked with Las Vegas Global Economic Alliance in a coalition that we assembled of all the municipal governments, the university system, the workforce connections folks, uh, a few other uh, smart individuals, and we have filed for a $75 million grant to help address some of the infrastructure gaps uh, that we have in Southern Nevada that are impeding our ability to uh, land some of the manufacturing interests and logistics interests we'd like to see here, plus um, do some work uh, further into the future and help address some of the issues in the startup community where you are. Hopeful that that grant will be favorably received. Uh, the Assistant Secretary uh, has made, uh, has visited with Nevada twice, both in Washington, D.C., and uh, she traveled out here uh, just a few days ago, or a few weeks ago, and we met with her at the West Side School, the historic West Side School here in Nevada. So we have that going on with the Department of Commerce. We have an opportunity for about $90 million in small business assistance through a small business credit initiative. 
um, that we are standing up. There was a similar program in the Great Recession that totaled about $14 million. This would be a 10 year plus program. Um, and so we're very carefully uh, working towards uh, getting that underway. The governor and, and, and his new chief of staff has prioritized uh, for GOAD that uh, the four, four core priorities. The first being uh, the management of the pandemic and as, wherever we can provide assistance there. The, that is in very good hands. Uh, second is the deployment of the ARPA dollars. And we're working to assist now after the Treasury's listening tour and prioritizing uh, that in the area of economic development. And with our partners, uh, also uh, Terry Reynolds in housing and Elise Caffaretti uh, in, in, in the workforce space. Uh, prioritized housing. Uh, we were told by a national expert that was in Las Vegas to speak to the LBGA that it is very important in the economic development space now to be addressing housing challenges, the uh, challenge of uh, child care, and the challenge of workforce retraining. It is less about bridges and tunnels, and it is more about these things to uh, have the companies come here. Um, so it's a very exciting time in economic development, and I, I understand we're, we're in a splendid position. We have a group, wonderful group of companies to bring forward today. Uh, we'll work through the metrics uh, of how the uh, economy has been doing. Uh, we sent Bob Potts's prison, uh, a summary of the state economy out about a month ago to you all, and uh, and we'll also, uh, if you wish, we can also touch upon the, the challenge we have right now with uh, you know having helping workers return back to work. I will say in closing, I had a friend in Ohio who invited me to sit in the background on a Zoom call at an economic development conference in Ohio. We are dealing with challenges of how we get our workers retrained and for jobs that have been created, how we get infrastructure for manufacturers and logistics companies that want to come here, how we deal with economic growth. Um, I was sitting there listening to folks talk about how do we get anyone interested in our region? very stark difference. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, all signs are very positive. We are, are busy working away on all of these matters. And I appreciate all of your support and guidance as, as we work through this. And I would say to fellow board members, you are welcome anytime to come by the office and we'd be glad to give you a more in-depth uh, briefing on any of the topics that we have in front of us. And uh, Governor, with that, uh, I'd, I'd like to introduce Stacy Bostwick. We have one item from the last um, board meeting. We, uh, uh, we didn't put it on the agenda correctly for public consideration. We got it on the agenda correctly this time. And this would help set the, as you may recall, we have a workforce innovation fund, and this would kind of help set the, the eligibility standards for that fund. And uh, Stacy can give you a, a quick summary of that and answer any questions you might have about it, but we need a board vote on that. Right, before I move on to that item, because that's number five, do we have any questions of Director Brown as it relates to his report? Governor, it's Ray Speck. Uh, can we address the addendum to director's report that uh, Michael Brown submitted to us? Sure. Okay, I just have uh, two comments and one question. One small comment is, uh, Michael, it'd be great if we can add a date when we originally approved these so we can see if any of these items are getting stale dated. So that'd be awesome. Thank you. Yeah, we can do that. Uh, this report is, is very helpful. Let us know where the companies are going. Uh, Governor, the other comment I just wanted to make is I was just floored when I read everything that Google is doing for our state and how they're becoming a great community citizen. I just wanted to recognize them and their efforts for uh, helping residents in our state. Uh, the one question I did have, Michael, is on advanced manufacturing products. They couldn't find lease space, and unfortunately, they're going to wait until next summer. Any reason why they are not looking now? Um, I think they are looking now and we're working with them. Melanie, do you have an update on that? I think I yes, that. we are aware of that situation and LBGEA is, is as well. And we, we continue to work with the company to provide any support that we can. Um, they, they are just taking a pause to consider their options, but they are still very interested in Nevada. Okay. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. Any other questions for Director Brown or his staff? Yes. This is Barbara Sagaski, Governor. Go ahead. And I just wanted to thank Michael Brown for talking to um, my Chief of Staff, uh, Scott Anderson and I, and going over the details of all of this. And I will have a couple comments on number five, uh, just because I still don't quite understand that one. 
but I just <coughs> wanted to thank um, Michael Brown and his staff for being there for us. Again, you have a tremendous amount of people that are willing to go over everything with us and talk to us and help us uh, before we come to the meeting. So I just wanted to um, make that statement and, and thank Michael Brown and his staff again. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Secretary Sagaski. Anyone else? Okay, I'm gonna close number four then and now move on to number five. Director Brown, go ahead. Thank you. And um, I'm gonna ask Stacy if she can refresh everyone as to um, what, what we need here. Thank you, Director Brown, Stacy Boster, Director of Workforce Development with GoEd for the record. Um, so what you have in front of you is um, following the most recent legislative session, um, there were some updates made to the statutory language for GoEd's WIN fund. Um, and um, ultimately, and, and so Senate Bill 24 asked for some clarity, which includes defining high skill and high wage jobs, um, which is something the board was tasked to do um, in that language for the purposes of those wind fund investments. And just very brief um, context, we utilize that fund to make strategic investments bringing together industry and education to ensure that we have the workforce training programs and talent pipelines for new and existing businesses um, to recruit and retain qualified employees. So um, we provided some backup in terms of context. I work closely with our, our research team um, to kind of set up this um, information and um, I won't walk through each piece of it, so I'll just be available for questions if you have any. Okay, Secretary Sagasti, you wanna go ahead? Yes, thank you so much. Um, well, first of all, I, I was wondering if you could explain a little more in detail the average and the medium, median um, hourly wage, uh, what that is. And my biggest concern with this whole um, us telling somebody how much they have to pay somebody has to do with being a, um, a store owner. I owned a convenience store for 17 years, or I'm sorry, 13 years. And um, we, we paid people according to their skill level and um, how much experience they had. And this, um, I, I don't see that here. I see that you're telling everybody they have to have a certain wage and that just concerns me. So if, if you could go with those two, I'd, I'd really appreciate it. And thank you, Governor, and, and thank you, Stacy. No problem. Thank you, Secretary of State, Stacy Boston, for the record again. And I, I think there's a couple of things. Um, I think one of the important elements to this is that we tried to benchmark the wage to the occupation. And in that respect, you are not um, comparing apples and oranges. Um, you're comparing apples and apples. And um, it, so, so where, where a job may typically have a $14 an hour wage isn't necessarily having to benchmark against a $40 an hour wage. So we're benchmarking it against particular occupations, and that's that 85% threshold, but also kind of saying with public funds, uh, we need to invest in programs that are training talent. And for jobs that require training to obtain the job, um, the, the baseline is, starting point is $17 an hour. For a little bit of context, our current average wage um, for wind funded projects. So that's that entry point right after training. And those are training programs we either help to build or to increase in terms of capacity is $20. Um, so we've left ourselves some room um, to, to still manage within that space, but the average wage um, for us is still higher than what we're recommending as a baseline. And did that explain the medium and the average uh, Secretary of State Stacey Boster again for the record. So um, are you asking why we decided to use average wage versus median wage yes. in terms of a benchmark? Yes. Okay. Um, I will probably muddle that and I really hate to pass the baton, but we, broadly speaking, average wage is a better sense and is actually tends to be on the lower side where median tends to be a higher number. I mean, isn't always the most appropriate analysis, but that I'm speaking out of turn, that might be more of a Bob question or a Chelsea question. If um, if you would like for them to dive in, I'm sure they'd be happy to volunteer themselves for that. Okay, and, and I appreciate it. My, my concern is that you're not letting the employer dictate how much somebody should be making. And, and that's where I have an issue. So um, I, I understand we're 
you're all coming from what, uh, now, and thank you, Stacy, for that explanation. I probably won't be supporting this only because I believe that the employer should be the one that dictates um, what somebody should be should be making, and I do have an issue with that. But um, anyway, go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you, Governor. Ma Madam Secretary, if I might just say, I think what we're also trying to do is say that if you're going to partner with the state and use the public dollars in this space, you know, we're just setting a, a minimum a minimum floor for this. This is what we want to see. You know, uh, if you're going to tap state resources for these this kind of a program. Great, thank you. Thank you, Director Brown. I really appreciate your comments as well. Thank you, Mr. Potts, did you wanna add anything? Well, I guess the only thing I can add in is talking about the difference between these two measures of central tendency, right? So the median is the middle point. Every, uh, you got 50% above, you got 50% below, where the weighted average talks about the actual distribution. And that's why we like to deal with the weighted average weight so that we get a true measure of central tendency. Does that help? I understand what you're doing, <laughs> Mr. Potts and Director Brown. I, I really do. I I um, I just disagree with um, how you're doing it, but that's fine. That's uh, thank you very much for the explanations. Thank you. Do we have any further questions from any board member on item number five? Hearing and seeing none. Do we have a motion on item number five? I make a motion to approve. Jay Barrett. Jay Barrett made a motion to approve. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing seeing none. This uh, is Dana Bennett, I'll second. Okay, we have a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed say no. Nay. No. Uh, could Barbara the record Sigaski. reflect that was Secretary Sagaski? Yeah. Thank you, Governor. And Thank it's you. not that I don't understand what you're doing. <laughs> I, no, I I, it's a philosophical yeah. difference. I understand. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Item number six, metrics report. Thank you, Governor Chelsea Wahlberg for the record. Um, I'm just going to take a moment to share my screen here. All right, Jeanette, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it just fine. Thank you, Chelsea. Wonderful. All right, I will just be going over the summary page here. Um, so um, as it's been for the past couple of reports, we are looking mostly very positive in terms of our programs within GoEd. Um, year to date in, in 2021, we have 67 assisted companies. That's up 123.3% over the prior year to date. Um, initial jobs from those companies totals 4,850 jobs, that's up 176.8% over the prior year to date total. And once those jobs are built out, we're, we'll see 8,831 jobs, and that's up 222.4% over the prior year. So that's all very positive. Um, our average weight, our average wage year to date is down just ever so slightly, 3.5% down, um, but is still relatively high at 27.17%. Um, and our average wages from this quarter in particular brought that up quite a bit. Um, they're in the 30s, so that's wonderful to see. Um, our assisted company investments year to date are totaling 822.3 million. That's up 44.5% over the prior year to date total. Um, our number of leads and prospects are a little mixed if we're looking prior quarter versus prior year. Um, over the quarter, our leads are up 162.1%. Um, over the year, it's down 8.7%. Um, over the same quarter in 2020, Q3, um, we're totally, totaling 167 leads there. I do think it's important to mention that nominally that isn't down much though. Um, we had about 180 something leads in the same quarter of last year. So we're still looking very strong there. Um, the number of prospects, we're at 36. Um, that's down 21.7% over the prior quarter and 7.7% over the prior year. Um, that's down only three prospects over last year, though. So the percentages can be a little bit misleading. Um, looking at the number of wins, we have 26 wins and quarter three, that's up 73.3% over the prior quarter and 136.4% over the prior year. 
Um, moving on to our global metrics, um, we've shifted our focus onto the global step grant. Um, that is a biennium that we win that grant for. Um, so we're in Q4 out of the two years. Um, so far, there's been 115 jobs created um, and we're up 79.7% over the prior quarter and almost 6 million in cumul cumulative export sales from companies aided by the STEP grant. Um, and that's up 203% um, over what was approved. Um, by EDA. Um, so looking at our em emerging small business program, um, these metrics are the same from last metrics report um, that only gets reported twice a year. Um, but we have 148 contracts and 3.3 uh, million is the total value of those contracts. Our rural community development block grants, um, this is going to be our totals for fiscal year 2021. These numbers shouldn't change for the whole year. Um, there are eight grants, that's down 20% from the prior year. Um, we have 3.4 million in total available dollars for funding allocation. I would like to point out that we do have less grants, but we have strategically decided to um, pick fewer grants that are more robust. Um, to, to spur more economic development activity with those grants. Um, for our Procurement Technical Assistance Center, we have 1,357 total clients. That's up 0.5% over the prior year. And the total award um, amount won by active clients in the first quarter of their fiscal year 22 is 147.2 million. That's down 18.5% from the prior year. Um, last year's um, quarter one total was extremely robust um, compared to other first quarters. This is more on track with our typical amount won by active clients. Um, and finally, our Nevada Film Office, we had 101 productions, up 29.5% from quarter one of fiscal year 21. Um, and our client satisfaction survey has been holding steady at 101.5, which is the highest rating they can get. So our clients are quite happy with our Nevada Film Office's services. Thank you. Do we have any questions regarding the uh, board? Any board member have a question? Okay, thank you, Chelsea. We'll move on to item number seven. Uh, Mr. Potts, unemployment rate update. Yeah, so for the record, Bob Potts, Deputy, Dir Deputy Director with GoEd. Um, I'm going to, this unemployment rate update, as I've talked about before, this resolution is in place to encourage job creation in the counties where the unemployment rate is higher. Um, if you look at the state's economy overall right now, um, we are, as measured by jobs and the unemployment rate, we've pretty much uh, recovered other than Southern Nevada and casino accommodations. We're currently down about 79,000 jobs in the state. Uh, 66,000 or so of those are in casino accommodations. So um, it's, a, it's a very interesting economy that we're dealing with now, and it leaves Clark County as the only county that's above this 7% threshold, making them eligible for full abatements and the companies uh, that show up for those. So. Um, I would like to talk a little bit, if we got a bit of time here, uh, there's, there's this ongoing question out there why there's so many openings when there are still people unemployed. Um, and, and, and particularly in, in kind of some of these micro, micro parts in, of our economy like casino accommodations, okay? Um, having, more, uh, having more openings and hires is not a new story. That's a normal, kind of a normal event. Um, but it, if there's a perceived shortage of workers, that kind of gets ramped up. Now, um, that's not necessarily a bad thing. That means there's a lot of churn in the economy. When you have this many openings and all these things going on, it shows that there's confidence in the labor market right now. So there's, there's things that are going on that are positive. Um, but uh, 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 there's some of them that are acute, so they're short term. And then there's some longer underlying issues that I think that we really need to think about going forward. Um, first in that list is there's more boomers retiring than Gen Z's coming in, okay? 
Um, that's not uh, a cause by the pandemic. The pandemic just accelerated that. That's an event that we know as the aging of the population happens, it showed up in the, 2000, in the 2020 census, and we're seeing this going forward, um, not only with the population, but the workers, right? And the pandemic, what it did is it created an opportunity and a motivation for a lot of boomers that would not have retired to retire. So that's part of what's going on. And then there's the disconnect between the, the skills, uh, you know, so a lot of boomers are leaving, uh, you know, middle, senior management, whatever, um, and the Gen Zs don't have the skill set. So there's that skill sets mismatch. There's also a skill set mismatch between uh, industries. So leisure and hospitality to some of our other industries that are actually structurally really growing. And we're already starting to see diversification into some of the areas like transportation and warehousing, warehousing and transportation, as well as in um, as administrative support services. Um, those have grown to the point that it's beyond just a seasonal phenomenon. Um, those are some structural changes that are going on that I think that will bode good for us going forward and gives us opportunity to really kind of accelerate that in our diversification efforts. It's a lot easier to roll with the current uh, than it is flat water or against the current. So we uh, there's that going on. Um, there's still the issue with daycare. Daycare has only recovered about 50% of what it was pre-pandemic and we were low pre-pandemic. So there's an issue there why there's a part of the reason why there's um, more openings, all these openings uh, with a higher unemployment rate. Um, there's still an expectation by employees that their job is coming back. We've heard that story before. Um, and then on the other side of that equation, there's an expectation of continued low wages uh, from the employer side of things. There's been suppressed wage growth ever since the late 90s. And I think that expectation is going to have to shift as well. Uh, structurally and on the expectation side, we're going to have to think about not only wage uh, suppression, uh, but it goes along with uh, low interest rates and the inflation rate. And a lot of times those are all correlated together. We a lot, a lot of us wear two hats, right? We're both wage earners and we're consumers, right? And so those are going to move. So there's a lot of moving parts that are going on right now. Um, uh, but I, again, that churn, I think, creates an opportunity. Objects in motion tend to stay in motion. And I think it creates an opportunity for economic development that we don't always get that we can really take advantage of. Um, I guess the last thing I'll mention is there's still continued healthcare concerns that are out there, especially with the new variants that are starting to show up. And that's um, causing some people to hold back a little bit too. So a um, lot of things going on, some short-term, some long-term, some easy fixes, some very difficult fixes, all of them uh, requiring some strategy and, and thinking as we go forward. So I'll leave it with that. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Mr. Potts? Governor, this is Dana Bennett. Go ahead, Dana. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Potts, thank you for that explanation. That There was some really interesting information in your report. And one thing that caught my attention, and it might be a difficult question to answer, was that you mentioned, uh, if I heard you correctly, 66,000 casino jobs um, are essentially lost. What is the expectation for those? Will we see those come back when uh, health is no longer uh, the major issue that it is now when some of these other changes take place? So ever, uh, again, for the record, Bob Potts, thank you, Ms. Bennett, for that. Um, so ever since the pandemic really kicked off, we took the Economic Advisory Council and we've really uh, tried to track what's going on, all tied back to the health situation. And for the past six, eight months, it's been made pretty clear to us out of that 67,000 or so that are currently unemployed, we're thinking that 40,000 of them will not have a job to return back to in that industry. Um, but I think there's going to be other industry opportunities, right? So there's, there's always that. And um, um, yeah, so I think that there's, there's a fundamental shift going on. It's really interesting. I think we're in the sixth or seventh month where we've had record gaming revenues, but we're still down 67,000 workers in casino accommodations. If you look at the leisure and hospitality as a whole, we're still down about a little over 72,000. So there's some real dynamics going on in that industry. Um, but again, I think there's opportunity that's tied into this that we can take advantage of. So, and, and, um, Thank you, Mr. Potts. Michael Brown, let me add, um, we have seen a shift of some of those workers into logistics and operations, and it, there's a stickiness to it. They're staying, 
there. And then this mm. is also why I say to my private sector board members, um, we have prioritized, uh, the governor's office has prioritized the work that is underway in housing and workforce retraining um, uh, using the ARPA resources that are coming our way. Thank you, Director Brown. I, I do agree that the, this is offering Nevada a, a unique opportunity and a lot of the work that GOED is doing is going to be critical to realizing the success of that opportunity. So, so thank you both and thank you, Governor. Thank you. Any more questions regarding the unemployment report update? Okay, I'm gonna close out item number seven, move on to item number eight, the abatement applications. Okay, Governor, um, the, the first uh, company we have um, is, is the Invasis Commerce LLC and I'll let our RDA introduce the company. Thank you, Director Brown. Good afternoon, Governor Sisolak, Secretary of State Sagaski, Director Brown, of course, and board members. For the record, Michael Walsh with the Las Vegas Global Economic Alliance. I'd like to introduce you today to Invasis Commerce LLC. Present with me today is their managing director, Diego Genera. Uh, Invasis Commerce LLC is requesting the sales and use tax abatement the modified business tax abatement and the personal property tax abatement. Invasis will have a capital equipment investment in excess of 75 million. They will hire 73 employees within the first 24 months of operation at an average wage of $24 and five cents. Invasis also offers a comprehensive benefits package to their employees. They meet and exceed the statutory requirements uh, set forth by GOED and has the full support of the LVGEA. Uh, Invasis Commerce LLC is part of the Invasis Universalis Group, a multinational company with 56 global manufacturing facilities and three joint ventures on four continents and over 25 years experience of manufacturing a number of product lines, including PET packaging, food and industrial packaging, and aluminum beverage packaging. The new facility, the new operation would produce and distribute packaging solutions for soft drinks, beer, energy drinks, teas, and non-carbonated beverage. I would now like to introduce you to Diego Genera to explain the project in further detail and to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, uh, Mr. Genera, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon, everybody. And Michael, thank you for the introduction. Um, so my name is Diego Genera. I'm the Managing Director for Invasis Aluminum Division here in the United States. Uh, I'm currently working out of our facility out in Waco, Texas. As we heard, Invasis is a multinational packaging company uh, with more than 56 manufacturing sites around the world. Our business is solely packaging. So we operate in three divisions, a PET division, which is plastic bottles, a general industrial line and aluminum beverage packaging. So today as we talk about our aluminum beverage uh, division, uh, we currently operate five can plants in that division. There's three plants in Mexico and two joint ventures, one in Guatemala and another in Panama. So this new plant we're proposing for Nevada will produce these aluminum beverage cans as we heard in various sizes. So we're excited to discuss our Nevada plant with you today as this plant is critical to growing our operational footprint here in the United States. Earlier this year in March, we broke ground on our first can plant in Waco, Texas, here in the US. After an extensive search throughout the Southwest region, we feel very strongly that Nevada, and specifically Las Vegas, is a great fit for our next facility. Las Vegas, not only strategic for investments, but also consistent with Nevada's economic development and diversification goals by bringing high-speed manufacturing to the area. Geographically, Las Vegas allows us to serve our customers in the Southwest region of the United States while bringing more high quality, high skilled jobs to Nevada. We're proud to create a work environment where we become the employer of choice in creating rewarding technical jobs and provide competitive wage and benefits package to our employees. As I mentioned earlier, we're very thorough in our site selections and where we build. And when we build, we build with long-term intentions. This level of investment, $75 million, it's here to stay in Las Vegas. It's not practical nor economical to move or relocate our specialized equipment after installation. We're building our plants with all the latest can making technology, which sets us up for decades of success here in Las Vegas. Additionally, this opportunity could open up future investments from Invasis. We talked about our multiple divisions, 
both in aluminum and in the PET and general line. Thank you for your time this afternoon to hear about our company and our ambitions in creating a long-term business success in Nevada. We appreciate Nevada's pro-business climate and state incentives programs, which were integral in our decisions to invest here in Nevada. And we look forward to a great partnership between Nevadas and the state of Nevada. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Janera. We appreciate it. Do we have any questions for Mr. Janera from the board members? We have a motion. Governor, it's Rice Buck. I'll motion to approve the sales tax, business tax, and personal property tax abatements. We have second a motion by, on. Second by Jay Barrett. We have a motion on the floor from Mr. Speck and seconded by Mr. Barrett. Is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing and seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any, those opposed say nay. Motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Janer. We appreciate it. Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome to Nevada. Thank you. Go ahead, Michael. Thank you. The next company is also coming to us through Las Vegas Global Economic Alliance. I think they have Good, afternoon. Good afternoon, Governor, Secretary of State, and Board Members. For the record, Nick Clayson with Las Vegas Global Economic Alliance. Uh, today, I have the pleasure to introduce you to Evan S. Packaging, a sustainable technology innovator focused on sustainable and economically viable packaging solutions. Jerry Lalonde, CFO of Evan S., will be representing the company today and also present from Evan S., uh, will be Douglas Horn, who is the CEO. Evan S. is requesting the sales and use tax, modified business tax, and the personal property tax abatements for a new facility in the city of North Las Vegas. Evan S. will hire 54 employees within the first 24 months of operation, an average wage of $24.19, and have capital equipment investment of over $10 million. In addition, Evan S. offers a generous comprehensive benefits package to their employees, including 80% health insurance coverage. Evan S. meets and exceeds the statutory requirements and has the full support of the LEGA. I will now turn the time over to Jerry to explain this project in further detail and answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. And uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Governor and Secretary Sageski, for the opportunity to present Evan S. Incorporated to you. Uh, at Evan S., we're very excited to be able to participate in the economic growth of Nevada and, and contribute to that growth. And for the record, I am Jerry Lalonde, CFO of Evan S., and I am joined today by Mr. Douglas Horn, our CEO. As Nick said in his introduction, Evan S. is a sustainable technology innovator focused on sustainable and economic economically viable packaging solutions. With our proprietary molded starch fiber technology, we are able to replace any styrofoam product with our own plant-based product that duplicates styrofoam but is entirely plant-based and compostable well within the current standards. In fact, if you can imagine a meat tray with a piece of chicken on it, imagine that once you've removed that piece of chicken from the tray, you can literally throw that tray into your back garden and in just over a month, you would only have dirt left. Truly a circular economy where you start with dirt, grow plants, make trays, compost them, and you are back to dirt. As we like to say, dirt to dirt. We also manufacture a form of plant-based biopolymer products that replicate plastic and yet are fully compostable. In fact, they are plastic, but plant-based plastics in which are again, compostable, dirt to dirt. Our technology is truly disruptive and will assist the world and the state of Nevada to take on the challenge of the elimination of single-use plastics. We are pleased to report that we have already signed a lease on a 114,000 square foot manufacturing facility located in North Las Vegas, and we have hired our first three employees, the first of 114 initial jobs we intend to create in Nevada. Early next year, we will be installing our first biopolymer manufacturing lines in that facility, and by the middle of next year, our first molded starch fiber lines will be in place. By the end of 2022, our facility in Nevada will be producing over 2 billion straws and over 87 million meat trays annually, and will employ over 114 employees. So let me close my statements by saying that we are committed to building our business in Nevada, as event evidenced by our establishing of our manufacturing facility in North Las Vegas and hiring of employees, we are in Nevada to stay and grow. Thank you for your time. Mr. Horn and I will now respond to any questions you may have. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Do we have any questions regarding this application? 
Governor Trace Beck, I just had one comment, one question, if I may. Please. Thank you. Uh, the comment is, it's great to see a company come into our state, not just for economic development, but also for what you're going to be doing for the environment. This is great to see. Love to see something like this grow in our state. That's great. The question I had is, I noticed on the applications of job creation 54, but you gave some numbers that were a lot higher than 54. Can you update on that? I think basically the 54 is the initial number. And as we build out over the next few years, our intent is to go to 114. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Governor. Great. No, you made good points. I appreciate that, Ray. Any further questions? Do I have a motion? Anybody? Havens. Um, I move that the sales tax abatement, uh, modified business tax abatement, personal property tax abatement for Evance Inc. is uh, delineated in uh, agenda item 8B be approved. We have a motion on the floor. Is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing and seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those, those opposed? Aye. By saying nay. Motion passes. Thank you, gentlemen. Congratulations. Welcome to Nevada. Great. Thank Margaret. you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Next one. Governor, we now go up to uh, Northern uh, Nevada, Carson City, to Amy Miller at the Northern Nevada De Development Authority. Good afternoon, Governor, Secretary of State, and board members. For the record, I am Amy Miller, Director of Business Development for Northern Nevada Development Authority. I want to thank the board for considering the modified abatement application for Linico Corporation. The company is applying for sales and use tax abatement, personal property tax abatement, and the modified business tax abatement. Linico Corporation plans to establish a lithium battery recycling facility in Story County. Linico recycles batteries, electronics, and end-of-life products using environmentally sustainable technology to produce 99.9% .9 pure cathode. Linico's mission is to create valuable state-of-the-art clean technologies to power the world in an environmentally sustainable way to reduce the global carbon footprint for tomorrow's generations. Additionally, lithium supply security has become a top priority for technology companies in the United States and in Asia. Linico will hire 30 employees initially with the average wave of wage of 35 dollars and 96 cents per hour and will pay 100 percent of their employees health insurance premiums. NNDA fully supports Linico Corporation's incentive application and respectful, respectfully requests the board approval of this request. On the call with me today is Corrado, chairman of the board and CEO of Linico Corporation, who is here to talk a little bit more about the project and answer any questions the board may have. Thank you, Amy. Um, thank you, Governor, Secretary. State Director Brown and board members um, are really the the mission of our company um, and even our parent company is to decarbonize. We have uh, just recently filed patents on a state-of-the-art crushing separating dry safe uh, battery crushing system that has um, a zero waste closed loop operation. Um, we're also um, about to file a patent which we believe is unique in the industry um, in terms of being able to extract fully the lithium from the black mass at the front end of the process. Linico itself stands for lithium nickel cobalt <laughs> as the acronym um, to be able to recycle and renew these uh, critically scarce minerals here in the state of Nevada. We've secured a facility in the uh, Tri-Center that was essentially abandoned. It was a, uh, literally a state-of-the-art battery metal recycling facility, uh, but the lead battery recycling operation uh, decided not to pursue manufacturing, um, and we were able to secure that facility. We also secured a 200-acre site in Mound House um, in Lyon County as well, uh, Astoria County, uh, for safe storage um, you know, of the materials uh, to complement the processing that will occur in the Tahoe Reno Industrial Center. Um, the average wage, uh, as Amy said, uh, just under $36 because we're hiring engineers, metallurgists, um, uh, design experts, quality uh, managers, as well as, as operating um, uh, employees in the facility. We have, um, we have 
uh, operations planning to start up with um, with uh, full crushing and separating through black mass in May of 2022, uh, and then uh, adding the lithium extraction component on subsequent to that uh, before the end of uh, 2022. Uh, so we're very excited. Uh, we know that there are uh, other uh, battery mineral recyclers, and you know, frankly, um, we we think they're good companies and. And um, there's an incredibly high need. Uh, we think we have some extremely unique technology uh, per our patents, and we're you know we're excited to to have Nevada be a serial one zero zero one site, and and the headquarters and platform uh, for Linico. Thank you very much for your explanation. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Do we have any questions on this application? <coughs> Anybody Governor, I'm sorry, Governor Trace, but I just have one question, please. Please, Ray, go ahead. Excellent. Well, it's great to see that we have the opportunity to be a state leader in a high growth industry where it's going to be the largest lithium battery recycling in North America. That's great. The one question I have is how much waste will be deposited here in the state? So there's um it, it's it's designed to be a closed loop system the the materials that uh, it, and i'll answer this um with two or three uh salient points first we have a dry contained uh, crushing system which is different than what we're seeing with some of the other industry participants uh, they're submerging the materials underwater um, and and what's happening is it retains a lot of the contaminants and a lot of the plastics our process will burn off um, will burn off all of the um, uh, electrolytes as well as any of the contaminants with um, with almost no volatiles emitted. Uh, the biggest part of our uh, pre-diligence was to ensure that we capture all the emissions. We were lucky that the state-of-the-art facility already had a pretty extensive uh, bag house and air quality control system put in and we've enhanced the engineering to ensure that firstly. Secondly, um, you know, as we go downstream, we're, we're going to be producing cathode active, active materials. So not just producing lithium nickel cobalt, but actually co-precipitating cathode materials. That usually consumes a tremendous amount of water, um, you know, and, and waste resulting. And we, we've invested in a full wastewater treatment recycling facility to have no use of water. Uh, so th and thirdly, um, because we're using um, and extracting all the graphite from the black mass, all of the uh, lithium from the black mass, and then fully processing uh, the, the residual smaller um, nickel, cobalt, manganese. Uh, we have very, very little. I don't. I wouldn't have the exact number, um, but it's um, you know fraction of a fraction of a percent. And 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 in total scale, you know we're starting off um, at about thirty thousand tons of battery materials received producing about 15,000 tons of the reusable minerals um, at the end, but then another you know, 14 plus tons of steel, copper, aluminum. Uh, so it's, it's almost a fully closed loop. Thank you, sir. Do we have any other questions regarding this application? Governor, this is Dana Bennett. Go ahead, Dana. Thank you. Um, I just have a quick comment. I noticed that this application is the only one in our packet today where the company is proposing to pay 100% of the employee's health insurance premium. And so I want to commend Linico for that, uh, for planning in that direction. And uh, I think with the, even though we've got a couple of high unemployment rates in the state, there's going to be a lot of competition for employees and uh, companies would be wise to look at that particular benefit. And I think Linico has set a good example here. Thank you. Thank you. Very good point. I agree wholeheartedly. Any other questions or comments? We have a motion. Governor, I'd make a motion for approval of the uh, sales tax abatement modified business tax abatement, personal property tax abatement for Linico Corp. Thank you. We have a motion from Mr. Barrett. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing seeing none. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 And any opposed, say nay. Motion passes. Thank you. Okay. Kind thanks. Kind Thank thanks. you. Uh, welcome to Nevada. Uh, yeah, congratulations. Welcome to Nevada. 
Thank you. Governor, we stay up north with Amy Miller to introduce our next company on behalf of Northern Nevada uh, Development Authority. Thank you again. Good afternoon, Governor, Secretary of State, and board members. Again, I am Amy Miller, Director of Business Development for Northern Nevada Development Authority. I want to thank the board again for considering the modified business or abatement application for local bounty corporation. The company is applying for sales and use tax abatement, personal property tax abatement, and the modified business tax abatement. Local Bounty plans to establish a controlled environment agriculture facility in Douglas County. Local Bounty uses sustainable agriculture technologies to grow fresh greens and herbs 365 days a year in its facilities, using 90% less water and land than traditional agriculture. Its sustainable root on living products result in less environmental impacts and carbon footprint and waste. Local Bounty provides prides itself in being an engaged community partner and employer of choice. Its team takes pride in working with local organizations, schools, and nonprofits to provide education and training to new generations about the natural, nutritional, and environmental benefits of innovative indoor farming. Local Bounty will hire 65 employees initially with an average wage of $26.69 per hour and pay 80% of their employees' health insurance premium. An NDA fully supports local bounty corporation incentive application and respectfully requests board approval on this request. On the call with me today is Laura Ham, Government and Community Affairs Manager for Local Bounty Corporation, who is here to talk a little more about this project and answer any questions the board may have. Thank you, Amy. And I actually have two other people with me today that I want to kick over to first. So Mike Shaw, if you wouldn't mind starting us off. Sure. Uh, Governor, uh, my name is Mike Shaw. I'm the Vice President of Real Estate and Construction for Local Bounty. Uh, I want to give a big thanks and a shout out to your staff. Their efforts, communication, professionalism, definitely a top notch. Your staff created this welcome to Nevada uh, feel on day one. Uh, we're excited about this project and the opportunity to become part of uh, the Minden community. Uh, pass it over to Laura. Thanks, Mike. And Leslie is also with us today. Hi, I'm Leslie Wagner with Genovas, and Genovas is a national site selection firm, and we work with corporate clients throughout North America, helping them navigate the process and would echo Mike's comments with respect to the efficiency, um, particularly of Amy Miller of the Northern Nevada Development Authority. Thank you. Thanks, Leslie. Um, so as Amy mentioned, we're an indoor farming company. We are currently specialized in lettuce. Um, we have a real focus on high quality lettuce products and products that we provide. One of the things that's really special about our lettuce product is that we've developed a product. It's a cut lettuce. It comes in a, a clamshell container, and it is lasting between three to five weeks in people's refrigerators, which is just so far beyond what we're seeing in most commercially available lettuces. Um, that commitment to that high quality produce has led us to really drive into how we can use technology. And we've made a combination of a vertical farm and a greenhouse farm and brought those together to give us you know, really the most efficient way to grow these products in a way that's really healthy and nutritious. Um, we're indoor, we're year round, 365 day a year agriculture employment, which is something that's pretty unique and is providing that full time opportunity for our workers. Um, it's really been an interesting way for folks that are interested in moving into the agriculture business to find a way to do that. And we've also seen quite a few folks who have been working in field-based agriculture and doing a lot of that seasonal work coming to us looking for that stability and that, that long-term employment opportunity. Um, that fits really well with our company's commitment to our communities, our commitment to our employees, and the commitment that we have to sustainability. And those are things that every action we take, we really look at and consider. And so as we were looking at Nevada, we looked at the strong agriculture background up in Minden and said, you know, we think there's something that would be a really good fit here with what that community has historically and where we might be able to come in and provide some opportunities as we look at agriculture in a new technology way. Um, We've had a commitment to that livable wage and that full benefit. We have the same benefit package for our CEO as we do for our entry-level employees and all of those benefits start on day one. Um, I think I'm at the end of my time, but I'd be happy to take more questions. Thank you. 
Thank you. I just had one before I turn over the board. Is your facility at all used to grow cannabis? It is not. Okay. It is predominantly lettuce. Uh, we are moving into some herbs like basil, uh, mint, those kind of things are in the future. Arugula, spinach, all in that, that lettuce category. Okay, thank you. Do we have any questions for this applicant? The governor, governor, this is. Go ahead. Go ahead, Dr. Bennett. Governor, this is Dana Bennett. Yeah, sorry, I'm on audio and it makes it kind of tough, but I appreciate the indulgence of, of everyone. Um, thank you so much for this presentation. I was looking at your application. I, I appreciate your your benefits explanation, but it says that you are also considering Colorado, Utah, and California as potential locations. And I'm wondering where your decision making is um, today. Thank you. Yeah, so we are currently conducting due diligence on a piece of property in Minden. Um, Nevada is definitely at the top of our list for this next location. And I might, I, I might just add too, at the uh, at the time that the application was done, um, you know, there there were a lot of uh, options under consideration. But again, given the um, attractive business environment of Nevada and the team that sort of sprinted into action to satisfy all of the operational and location needs of the company, Nevada, as Laura mentioned, is top top of mind and. We're hoping that the due diligence resolves and we'll, we'll close and get to construction very soon. And when might you be making a final decision on this? And Mike, you can give more details, but my understanding is that we hope to be able to close on our property early January and begin construction okay. shortly thereafter. Is that correct, Mike? Correct. We're finishing our due diligence process. Um, we have started a uh, project. It's under construction in the state of Washington. This will be our third facility uh, to serve Nevada and California. Um, right now, we are planning on closing on the land mid-January, uh, and we hope to be under construction sometime in uh, March. Great. Any further questions? Okay, do I have a motion on this one? Yes, sir, Governor. Governor. Dana Bennett. Okay, we have a motion, of, uh, motion on the floor from Dr. Bennett. Is there any discussion? Okay, seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, any opposed nay? Okay, motion passes. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Welcome to Nevada. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Hey. Governor, we move uh, back down south to LBGEA for uh, Smithfield Ham. Good afternoon, uh, Governor Sislak, Secretary of State Sagaski, Executive Director Brown, and, and board members. For the record, Chris Zunas, Vice President Economic Development for the LBGEA. I'd like to introduce you to Saratoga Food Specialties, a Smithfield packaged meat, meats company. Present with me here today is uh, Jim, Jim Benner, Vice President of Operations. Saratoga is requesting sales and use tax abatement, modified business tax abatement, and personal property, property tax abatement for their planned expansion at their North Las Vegas facility. This company will have a capital equipment investment of just under $17 million. They will hire an additional 56 uh, full-time employees um, at an average wage of $20.02 within the first uh, within the next 24 months of the expansion. This world-class food production company also offers a comprehensive health benefit package to their employees. The company, uh, this company expansion project meets the state's requirements and has the full support of the LVGA. I'd like now to introduce you to Jim. Uh, Bennett and to explain the project and company in further detail and answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, thanks for the opportunity um, to be here today. Um, first, I'd like to thank the entire Nevada economic development team um, led by you, Governor Sisolak and Melanie Sheldon and, and the whole team over at GOED. Um, the city of North Las Vegas has been extremely helpful and um, all other allies get to get this project going. Um, as you might recall, um, Saratoga Food Specialties um, applied for um, the same um, 
benefit when we took the facility over back in December of 2019. We purchased a company by the name of Chelton House that was closed, and we converted it from their um, spaghetti sauce manufacturing to uh, sauces and seasonings um, that really gave us a whole new product line out of, out of Saratoga Food Specialties. Um, of course, uh, after we closed in December of 19, we all know that the world changed completely. Um, yet our commitment to get that plant um, up and running and um, profitable for us was uh, never wavering. Um, despite those challenges um, and the help of everybody uh, to get that facility built, opened, and get employees hired, um, we, uh, we really prospered. So not only were we able to get our uh, sister Smithfield companies online, um, we were also able to um, secure a number of um, food service and restaurants um, to go ahead and, and pick up our product lines. Um, thanks to the pro-business climate of the state and the great workforce. Um, I run facilities both in Chicago and in Southern California and Orange County, and I have had absolutely no issues with staffing in North Las Vegas, and I can't say that for Chicago or for Orange County. Um, the, the employees have been great. The, um, ability to, um, get people interested in working is, is bar none as compared to my other locations. Um, we think that the future here for Saratoga at this location is, uh, is very bright and we're going to continue to grow. Um, I'm actually extremely happy that we happen to have some land on site that, um, we see even more. Uh, expansion going further. Um, companies like Taco Bell, KFC, El Pollo Loco, just to name a few of them on top of all of our Smithfield brands, um, have really given us a good anchor and North Las Vegas has given us the opportunity to, uh, to meet those uh, needs. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions on this application? Smithfield. Anybody? Great. Uh, do I have a motion? Anybody want to make the motion? Don't I know this is Dana Bennett. Okay. <laughs> um, I'll be so glad when we're back in person again. Um, I would like to move that we approve the application from Smithfield Packaged Meats Corporation for a sales tax abatement, modified business tax abatement, and personal property tax abatement as outlined in agenda item 8E. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate it. And Jim, I want you to know there's not a reluctance to make the motion. It's just a Zoom call stuff. <laughs> <laughs> We're all getting used to this and nobody knows who's doing what and raising hands and and everything. So it's no reflection on you or the application or Smithfield. Is there any Did I look nervous? Did I show nervousness? You looked like you were getting a little nervous. Yeah, I just thought of that. Like, calm your fears. Uh, any discussion? Hearing and seeing none. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. See, it was unanimous. Congratulations. Welcome to Nevada. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. Next one Stericycle. Yes, and we'll turn to Stan Thomas at EDOT. All righty. Um, Governor and Secretary of State and uh, Executive Brown and fellow board members, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Stair Cycle. For the record, uh, Stan Thomas, uh, EVP with uh, EDOT. Um, they are applying, Stair Cycle is applying for the sales and use tax abatements, the modified business tax abatement, personal property tax abatement. Um, Stair Cycle was founded in 1989. We'll go ahead 32 years to now. They're, they have over 15,000 employees, both in the U.S. and 16 other countries. Their core service uh, lines include regulated medical waste management and secure information destruction. They're looking at building about an 80,000 square foot facility on 20 acres in Story County in the Tahoe Reno Industrial Center. Um, at this time, uh, EDON, uh, they hit two of the three requirements and EDON supports um, this application. Um, I'd like to introduce to you Cassie um, Bittorf. Uh, she's a strategic development manager with uh, a stair cycle. Also, they have Dale Rich, vice president of global um, operations. 
And then the last person I want to introduce you to, and she'll uh, speak on behalf of, of StairCycle, is Kristen Aldrichik. She's the Director of Government Affairs. And Kristen, I'm going to turn this over to you so you can explain a little bit more in detail what you're going to be doing in Story County. Thank you, Sam. And Governor Sisolak, Director Brown, <clears throat> the distinguished members of the board, it's really a pleasure to be here today. And we thank you for the opportunity to talk about StairCycle and our plans. And we're thrilled to be part of what you're doing to ensure the prosperity of Nevada now and into the future. It's been really wonderful to hear a lot of the positive things that are going on. Um, so we do have folks here um, to answer any questions you have, but I'd like to give you a little bit of background on StereoCycle. So uh, for over 30 years, we've been providing safe, responsible, and sustainable management of medical waste. And by doing that, we're protecting communities, healthcare workers, patients, and our environment. And this is really you know, what's at the core of our business. We are all about protecting what matters. And if you look at the founding of our company, uh, we were founded in response to syringes washing up on shores back in the late 80s. And that's when it became very clear that there was a critical need for proper medical waste management. And so today, as the industry leader, we continue to help communities through outbreaks and natural disasters and other emergencies. And uh, I, I would like to give you, um, in terms of our uh, corporate responsibility impact, just a, a sense of what we've done um, over the past year. So we treated 1.5 billion pounds of medical waste diverted about 104 million pounds of plastic from landfills, safely disposed of about 40 million pounds of unused pharmaceuticals, and we recycled more than a billion pounds of paper through our secure information destruction services. But as you know, the last couple of years, it's really been about COVID-19, and a lot of our work has been supporting critical needs of healthcare providers and pharmacies and laboratories and testing centers. And so that's really been, uh, been a lot of our focus and we're proud of the work that we've done there. The medical waste transportation and treatment field is highly regulated. There are at least six federal agencies that provide oversight. Each state has rules and local governments provide oversight as well. The facilities, like the one we're planning to build in Nevada, primarily treat waste that's required to be incinerated. And so this new facility will help us meet regional needs uh, for compliant medical waste management, needs that are, have really been growing. With a $40 million investment, uh, or more than $40 million investment, this technologically advanced facility will also help support the local economy. And the incentives that we've applied for will help us invest further in state-of-the-art technology and provide continued benefits for employees and the community and our environment. We have been operating in Nevada for a number of years. We have two secure information destruction facilities here. So we're excited about expanding our business in Nevada and about becoming a part of the Story County community. In the communities where we operate, we, we do get involved based on local needs and uh, you know alignment with our values. And we plan to do the same and have started to uh, build relationships in Story County. So um, again, we're happy to answer any questions you have. We really appreciate the opportunity to, to speak with you today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Stericycle? Governor Jay Barrett, um, I, if I may. Please. Uh, first of all, I, a comment being that this is outstanding to have this reinvestment by such a, a unique and specialized company. Um, thank you for doing this. I really do um, see this as um, a special star on what we in Nevada are able to provide. I, I, I have a question. When you forecast out your, your people needs, what kind of skill sets are you looking at and how are you addressing procuring those people? I'll, I'll take that one, thank you. So in terms of our needs, we do anticipate um, hiring to start 38 
um, skilled employees at our facility with the expectation that we will probably exceed over 50 um, employees at this location. Um, we have already started building relationships with local organizations, um, schools, with the goal of identifying um, local employees in the area. Um, in terms of, of skill, we, we do um, operate specialized equipment and that does require training um, that is obviously conducted at the onset of our operation starting and then obviously ongoing um, training will be provided. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Certainly. Any further questions on Cycle? I'm going to trace back if I may ask one question. Please, Ray, go ahead. Thank you. It's great to see that our state was selected to handle the Western United States and Western Canada region. So very appreciative of that. Uh, the one question I had is with all this coming to our state, at the end of the day, how much waste will be end up being deposited here? Some of the question that was asked earlier. I'll answer that question. Um, the facility at full capacity is 84 tons a day. We expect about an 85% reduction uh, through the thermal uh, destruction process. So max capacity about 12 tons a day uh, would be going to a local uh, properly permitted landfill. Do, do we have somebody from Story present or could someone could answer the question regarding the capacity of that landfill at 12 tons a day? That's, you know, 4,000 tons a year. Okay, somebody from Edon want to answer that? Yeah, let me put this, I had this thing muted. From what I understand, uh, we have plenty of capacity to handle what uh, Stericycle will be putting out. And so uh, when I've talked with Story County about this, they've been excited about this project. So obviously they've got the room for it as far as, I'm, as, far as I know at this point. Okay. Any further questions? Okay, do I have a motion on this one? Abens uh, moved to approve the sales tax abatement, modified business tax abatement, personal abatement for Stericycle Inc. as uh, noted in uh, agenda item 8 We have a motion on the floor. Is there any discussion on the motion? We're seeing none. All in favor, signify saying aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. Okay, motion passes. Thank you very much. Welcome to Nevada. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Director Brown, you want to go ahead now? Yes, Governor. Thank you. Uh, the next four abatements are under my uh, approval authority, but our, our practice in Nevada uh, for full transparency is that all of those still come to the board and I approve them during the board meeting. Um, we probably have the most transparent go at that I have yet to find as I've looked at my uh, counterparts in uh, another 49 states. So um, uh, with that, uh, we would, Governor, move to um, LBGEA. Perry will bring forward uh, the PureTech uh, company for, to brief the board. And if they have any questions, and then I can grant my approval. Thank you, Director Brown. Good afternoon, Governor, Madam Secretary, and members of the board. For the record, Perry Erson, Vice President of Business Retention and Expansion for the Las Vegas Global Economic Alliance, here today and show support of the application submitted by PureTech Incorporated. From the company's humble beginnings in 2017, developing an environmental technology for cleaning air and surfaces within locker rooms for professional sports teams, this pandemic provided an opportunity with a significant opportunity to grow into commercial and industrial applications as COVID-19 continues to disrupt business operations everywhere. As PeerTech gains notoriety on a national and a global level, the company is now concentrating on expanding op their headquarter operations in Southern Nevada to include advanced manufacturing. The expansion of PureTech would add 25 new jobs over the course of two years, producing an average hourly wage north of $40 an hour, and 75 jobs over five years, producing an average hourly wage of approximately $37 an hour. Capital investment projections uh, total approximately $137,000. 
This application meets the requirements set forth by the Governor's Office of Economic Development and has the full support of the Las Vegas Global Economic Alliance. And I'm pleased today to introduce uh, PureTech's founder and chief executive officer, Mr. Ray Edwards, who will provide further insight into the company's expansion. Ray? Thank you, Perry, and, and thank you to the Governor, Director Brown, the Secretary, Secretary of State, and the Board of the GOA for having us. Um, and I'll be brief. Our story is very simple and one that's probably relevant to most of us now. Uh, we started this little company when it was small back in Irvine, California, and uh, we heard a rumor. The rumor was that there was this magical place right about four hours away that was business friendly and loved tech startup companies, and we thought we'd check it out. Uh, we had evaluated where to take our business, as it's commonly known that California is not necessarily the cheapest place to build a business. It's not where the cheapest land and properties exist, and certainly the regulatory environment's a little different uh, than other places. And so with the help of the LBGEA and Perry's leadership as well, we kind of evaluated Nevada against a set of other three other states um, as to where to grow PureTech, and certainly Nevada won out for us, top of the list. And so uh, if you think about our customer base and what we do, PureTech's technology is very simple. Um, NFL teams were calling us saying that they were trying to play protect players from getting MRSA infections in locker rooms off the shower handles. And despite having millions of dollars of protocols in place to protect these players, they weren't getting the job done. So we engineered a simple solution that would do two things. One is it uses visibility to track what's happening indoors in spaces and look for risks. And it responds to those risks using treatments like UVC light, uh, ozone treatments in some cases, and ultrasound to protect players where people can't do it. And so, as you can imagine, our customers are everywhere, but as we thought about uh, Nevada in particular and Southern Nevada, Las Vegas, we realized that, uh, you know, Vegas and Nevada is the gateway to the world. As people, as the world reopens, people pop here first and they enjoy our gaming community and our facilities, and now we have an NFL team, right? So there are millions of people coming into Vegas. This is a great market for us to grow the business. Um, I'll report that we're proud to announce that Howard Hughes is one of our first commercial contracts here in Clark County. Uh, here in summer in their headquarters and now they have pure tech in their headquarters which allows them to reopen their offices and bring employees back to work safely uh, but we believe that uh, even our larger customers that aren't based in nevada like blackstone uh, we want a commercial contract with their eq office subdivision that they have 40 million square foot of office space and when they asked us where do we want to uh, pilot the technology for the first location we chose the Hughes center right here in vegas We'll continue to see more of those deals happen. And as PureTech grows locally, we want to bring our employees and our manufacturing base home, right? Right now, we manufacture a lot of our parts using outside contract help in Minnesota. Uh, but we've actually told them and sort of noticed that we're going to start bringing that talent in-house. So part of this abatement is to help support us hiring 25 uh, young and mid-tier folks that have experience. Some may not have experience, but we want to train, develop and bring more tech talent to Southern Nevada, in particular where we're based. And I'll just end this conversation by saying that uh, my co-founder, Farai, who's on the call, and I talked about this a lot. When we had a vision for leaving California, we recognized we were leaving arguably the most recognized place for high-tech talent in the world. People think of San Fran as the center of the tech universe, but we see a vision of Nevada being Silicon Desert, and we want to be one of the first pioneering companies to bring that tech base to uh, Nevada in particular, so we can grow our talent base here. So we're super thrilled to be growing here. 80% um, of our team members, our founding team, are underrepresented minorities that have experience and skill sets. So part of that initiative is also to support training, developing, and hiring more minorities in tech positions here in Southern, uh, Southern Nevada. Uh, so we're excited and thrilled to be partnering with the state for this program, assuming that this is approved, and, and really excited to bring bringing this technology here home and expanding it. Thank you. Okay, any questions on this one? Okay, Director Brown. Okay, I approve Pure Tech for its sales and use tax, modified business tax abatement, and personal property tax abatement. Okay, thank you. Next one, Rapid Response Monitoring Services. Thank you, Governor. Uh, again, for the record, Chris Zunas with the LVGEA. Uh, I would like now to introduce you to Rapid Response Monitoring Services Incorporated. Present with me here today is David Pida. Chief Financial Officer. Uh, Rapid Response Incorporated is requesting sales and use tax abatement, modified business tax abatement, and personal property tax abatement for their new service center facility slated to open in Henderson, Nevada. This company will be making a capital equipment investment of just over $1 million. They will be hiring 118 employees within the first 24 months of operation at an average wage of $22.75 per hour. This national security monitoring company also offers a comprehensive health benefit package uh, to their older employees. 
Uh, this new operation to Nevada meets the state's requirements and has the full support of the LBGEA. Before I turn it all over to David, I'd like to make one note referring back to Bob Potts comments. This company is very excited to retrain some of the folks that are not going to get hired back in the hospitality uh, strip corridor and they're looking forward to capture some of those customer service hospitality uh, uh, talent. So I think this is a, a great example of a company that will help offset some of that uh, some of that unemployment that uh, that we see from that industry. So I'd like now to introduce you to Dave Pida to explain the project and company in further details and answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Governor Sisolak, Madam uh, Secretary, and all the distinguished uh, board members. I appreciate your consideration for our application and many thanks to everyone on this call that has helped Rapid Response through the application process. Rapid Response has vetted many states and cities in our search for our third office. Because of the professional and expeditious support of the LVGEA, Rapid Response has selected Northern Nevada as our newest home. Thank you to Chris and the entire LVGEA team. Along with the support of the LVGEA team, we feel there is a real opportunity to add quality employees to our organization that have been displaced from the casinos all over the region. Rapid Response began operations in Syracuse, New York in 1992. Rapid is a, re a leading provider of electronic data and security monitoring services in the United States, Canada, Bermuda, the US Virgin Islands, and Jamaica. Our mission is to protect the lives and property, ensuring the safety and well being of individuals and commercial property for over 2.5 million sites. Some of our customers that you might be familiar with are Ring, the doorbell company, Amazon and their Alexa product, and Honeywell Fire. Thank you for your time and consideration. I look forward to being a, an employer in uh, your state and thank you for all your consideration. Thank you, I appreciate it. I think I probably misheard you. Where did you say you were gonna locate? In uh, Henderson, in Henderson, Nevada. Okay, I thought you said Northern Nevada, okay. Which would have surprised me being that it's an LVGEA application. Any questions? Yeah, Governor, it's a, he meant Southern Nevada. <laughs> okay. Yeah, they're, they're down here in Henderson. Okay, any questions of this applicant? You're seeing none. Director Brown, go ahead. Hey, I approve rapid response monitoring service inc for a sales and use tax, modified business tax abatement, and a personal property tax abatement. Okay. Last Thank one. You. Thank, Thank you. you, Director Brown. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, Director Brown. Oh, let's see here. All right. The design, uh, the next company is the Design Factory LLC. Thank you, Director Brown, again, for the record, Perry Erson with the Las Vegas Global Economic Alliance in show, show of support for the application submitted by the Design Factory LLC. Uh, for over 20 years, the Design Factory has provided the creativity and fabrication expertise for turning concepts into reality for customers across the globe in the trade show and conference environments. Uh, now, the ongoing pandemic impacted the company initially, but as trade show activity gained momentum, the company has an ever-growing need for consolidating operations that will allow for additional space and new team members to run and grow the business. Um, Design Factory's expansion will add 13 jobs over five years, producing an average wage north of $28 an hour, with capital investments projecting approximately $100,000. This application, again, meets the requirements set forth by the Governor's Office of Economic Development, has the full support of the Las Vegas Global Economic Alliance, and I'm pleased to introduce Design Factory's president and founder, Ms. Christine Harvey, who will provide further insight into the company's endeavors. Chris. Thank you, Barry, and thank you, Governor, and everyone on the board, uh, Director Brown and Madam Secretary. I'm pleased to be here today, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Design Factory. We're a full service exhibit house that does uh, rentals and sales for the convention and the live event industry. As you know, our business was terribly impacted with the close down of live events. And I'm happy to say though, with the shows returning in May and June, we've been able to uh, bring back most of our clients. Our business is almost at 2019 levels in sales and production, and we're ready to expand. 
We had planned the expansion before COVID-19 hit with our, our warehouse leases expiring. And now knowing that we feel confident that the business is there, we have um, uh, secured a lease on our new facility. And with this abatement, it would really help us get back into operation. Uh, I really am thankful for the opportunity and I'd love to answer any questions you might have about our, our business. Thank you. Uh, I have with me today also our sales and marketing director, Marcus Garcia, and he can answer any questions. Okay. Uh, do we have any questions for this application? Hearing seeing none, I'll turn it over to Director Brown. Michael, you're on mute. I approve the Design Factory LLC for a sales and use tax, modified business tax abatement, and personal property tax abatement. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Welcome to Nevada. Thank you. Thank you very much, Governor. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Okay, that wraps up the abatements. Item number nine, moving on to item number 10, board member comments. Do we have any board member comments? Governor Troy Speck, if I just may make one, please. Please. I just want to thank uh, Director Brown and his staff uh, on the enhancements to the void packages over the last couple of meetings. It's very succinct to the point and it's very helpful. So thank you for the continuous improvement on these void packages and helping us make decisions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other board comments? Okay. I don't have any comments other than to say we appreciate everything that GOWIT is doing and Bob, if we can do some more to get that unemployment number down, it would certainly be appreciated. We can. I know, we're all working in the same direction. Uh, I'll move on to public comment. This is the second time set aside for public comment. Anyone wish you to address the board on any item, please step forward to identify yourself for the record and comments will be limited to three minutes. Do we have any public comment? This is, Je this is Jeanette Hogan for the record. I do have Jared Smith that just raised his hand. Hi, Mr. Smith, you can um, proceed now. You have three minutes. Governor, I just wanted to take 30 seconds uh, to thank you and the GoEd staff. Uh, this has been a record setting year for Southern Nevada. Uh, we are so excited and I, I wanna let you know that we have up to nine applications already teed up for the next GoEd board meeting. Uh, so just wanna say thank you very much. We also are saying goodbye to Jonas Peterson, our CEO. I uh, wanted you to know that, and uh, if anybody on this board, uh, Governor, you or uh, your staff needs anything, you please feel free to contact me directly. And uh, just again, so much gratitude for the partnership with GoEd, our municipal partners, um, our board members, and our utility partners as well. So thank you so much. Thank you, sir. We wish Jonas all the best. Thank you. Any other public comment? This is Jeanette Hogan for the record. I don't have anyone else online or on the phone for public comment. Okay, thank you. We'll close public comment, move on to item number 13, adjournment. I don't need a motion for this one. We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Have a happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Same to you. Yeah.